My guest today is Josh Sharkey. He's the founder of Mies, the recipe software for culinary pros. Mies basically organizes the recipes that you have in your restaurant, in your pop-up, in your organization. So you can document, you can cost, you can scale, you can train, you can collaborate, and you can prep like never before. It's a really, really cool piece of software. Believe it or not, I actually got a demo of Mies a couple months ago. I was really impressed by what they're building to help chefs organize their recipes and to track real tangible data. And then like, what do you do with that information? How do you work better now that you have all this information and you are so well organized? If you enjoyed this interview, I highly recommend you queue up my conversation that I had with Aaron O'Leary, who also kind of made this transition from going from professional kitchens to tech. And he works at a company called Product Hunt. And it was really, really interesting to hear from him. And I think that there's a lot of crossover with these uh, two conversations. If at any point you'd like to pause and check out Josh, you want to check out Mies online or any of the specific linkable things that we discussed, please do check out the show notes, which are available in the description of this podcast or always available at justinconnacom slash media. So without further ado, let's talk to Josh. From cone row grills to two-sided sharpening stones, and I was actually just browsing their magnificent, right now, sales section with something like 45% off, some really beautiful Japanese bowls and plates. Corin is such a wealth of high-quality Japanese gear for chefs. If you want to check the link in the description of this podcast for new knives, if you want to upgrade your current kit or anything that you're looking for food-wise that might fall into the handcrafted, high-quality, uh, and surprisingly consistent and affordable prices too on a lot of their products, I would really, really suggest you check out Corin. The link is in the description, or you can always check out justincana.com slash Corin. Did you know that you can get diners to discover, to book, and to return to your restaurant all in one place? Yelp for Restaurants is leveling the playing field for all businesses on the platform with some pretty new and powerful tools, and I was really shocked to see what Yelp is doing. There are, believe it or not, several restaurants here in Seattle that I've had the pleasure of eating at that use Yelp for Restaurants, and it's so easy for me as a guest to put myself on a wait list, even if it's super busy, and then I just get a text when my table is ready, and that's super, super valuable as a user experience. And for business owners, this means bigger reach, this means tools for your front of house, and this means a much higher likelihood that guests will actually come back, especially if they're willing to create a profile, because you get a little bit of information about them. So get your business in front of millions of hungry diners with up to eight times better search performance online. There's probably a reason that when you search for a specific type of food or a specific type of restaurant, that Yelp shows up first as a as a SEO result and really put into practice some of the lessons that folks that have talked about restaurant marketing on this podcast have shared here and use Yelp to get there. For the first 10 folks that sign up using the link in the description, Yelp for Restaurants is paying business owners a $100 Visa gift card for booking a demo so you can see this tool in action and ultimately decide if this is something that could help your business. If you check it out and love it, Emulsion Podcast listeners also get three months free off of their annual subscription, making sure that you can get all the benefits with a pretty awesome discount. I also wanted to add, because I don't think most folks know about these dot points, no employee at Yelp has the ability to override the decisions that the software makes. I didn't know that. Also, there's no connection between advertising on Yelp and how the recommendation software treats a business's ratings and reviews. Again, this is not pay to play. Whatever has been pro proliferating, that is not the case. So again, check the link in the description and sign up and claim the $100 Visa gift card for business owners that book a demo while supplies last, or you can check out justinconnacom slash Yelp. Are you maximizing the revenue opportunities for your business? These days, customers want delivery, they want pickup, and they want online ordering at their fingertips. And DoorDash is powering more than half a million businesses to do just that. The infrastructure that you can get through DoorDash allows for you to get direct feedback in order to improve your customer experience and tailored recommendations to increase your sales. They've also launched a new partnership package where the commissions paid to DoorDash can be as low as just 15% or just 6% on pickup orders, giving you access access to millions of users that are browsing the app without any additional marketing effort for you. That was shocking to me because I thought the only option available through partnering with DoorDash was something like 30%. 
right? So DoorDash is offering listeners of the Emulsion podcast 0% commission, so you pay nothing on the first 30 days for the first 10 folks that sign up with a link in the description. You can also head to justinconnacom slash DoorDash and learn more, unlock new revenue streams for your business, and connect with more customers than ever before with DoorDash. Josh, thanks so much for coming on the show, and thanks for all that you do for Chefs with Mies. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Justin. I wanted to start with something we were talking about before the mics turned on. How in the world, because I get this question too, how in the world did you end up in Norway? Yeah, well, you know, when I was in college, I entered this contest. um, And I didn't didn't know much about the contest, but I ended up uh, uh, getting into the finals of the contest. And they flew me to New York City. And the judges were Marcus Samuelson and Rick Moonen and Eric Repair, Rocco Despirito. Uh, but it happened to be sponsored by the New, New Norwegian Seafood Export Council. Got it. Uh, so the winner of the contest was flown to Norway, and, and so I was very, very lucky at a very young age to be able to travel through Norway with Eric Repair and all these other chefs and food writers. Um, and so we we spent, you know, I forget how long it was, but a while, sort of just traveling the country, eating all over the place, um, you know, in the Lofoten Islands in the north, and then coming down south and landing in Oslo at the end. Uh, so it was through that through that contest that really was kind of like started my real sort of like fine dining career in, in cooking. What was the nature of the contest? Uh, well, again, it was sponsored by the New- Norwegian Seafood Export Council, and it was essentially, I think they were trying to promote uh, a, a Norwegian salmon. And uh, so I did a salad. I mean, this was, I mean, if I look back at it now, I probably would be like, oh my God, what the, what the fuck was that? <laughs> um, but it was like this, you know, cured and grilled Norwegian salmon. And so the, the idea was just come up with ways to use um, you know, to use salmon. And so they had, it was North America, South America. Um, and I think, I think just the Americas. Um, but yeah, and they had a couple categories. I think that's awesome to, you know, potentially get a little bit more, uh, to pull on that thread of your cooking background. What you, you mentioned that that gave you kind of like your first kind of deep dive into fine dining, but are there any other moments that you can remember where you're like, man, I, I really know how to cook at this point. I call it like the graduation moment question, if, if any kind of like days yeah, of your career yeah. come to mind. Well, it's funny because there was a there was a moment during that time when I was like, man, I really don't know how to cook. <laughs> you know, like uh, I, I was cooking from a very young age. My father passed away when I was 16 and I had to sort of cook dinner for the family. Uh, and I, I always thought I would be, I would go to, you know, I mean, at that age, I was wrestling, so I was going to add a scholarship to go to college for wrestling, and I thought that's what I would do. Uh, I never thought I'd be like a, uh, you know, just a, a chef. I ended up going to culinary school at Johnson Wales because they had a really good wrestling team. I got a scholarship, um, but it really wasn't until um, till working at there's this restaurant called Oro in Oslo. And this chef had just opened it called, uh, named Terje Ness. He had just won the Boku Store in 1999, and um, and I just remember vividly being in this kitchen with these incredible cooks. Um, at every sort of, you know, station. And I was with the entremetier and he was, uh, he gave me like this, like, you know, bushel of shallots, like all on the vine and dirty. And, um, it was like peel these. And, um, and he, as he was like running circles around me, like curing foie gras and all kinds of, I mean, he did everything. Um, and I'm like cleaning these shallots and cutting them. And he just keeps correcting me and correcting me and correcting me. And I'm like using my Japanese knife and trying to go all fast. And he like, you know, and I and I very quickly realized, like, oh, I don't know anything about cooking, but this is awesome. Um, you know, everything coming in every day. They had very few walk-ins, and just like everything was just like so pristine. And I would, and to that point, you know, I cooked in restaurants, but I'd never seen it at that level. And I was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is unbelievable. Um, so that was really a moment when I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't think it was really. I I, I cooked for many, many, many years. I let when I came back to New York, I. I worked um, at Oceana and at Boulay and, you know, for a little bit at John George. I worked for Floyd Gordeaux's at Tabla. Really, you know, through all of those times, I um, I think, you know, I would get to a point at each restaurant when, like, okay, I'm, I'm getting good now. Um, you know, and it was it always, it would always start the opposite. Uh, but I think it wasn't really until I started working with Greg Koontz that I really realized, like, oh, okay, I, 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 know, how to, I know how to cook. Um, you know, like, I can run a kitchen. What was your, during all that time, like, was the ambition to, uh, 
to open a restaurant of your own, to just become someone chef de cuisine and kind of be their number two? Like, what was going through your mind during that time? Because when I was going going off into the world, the goal for me was always like three Michelin star in Chicago. That was like my North Star, where it was like, gather as many skills and connections and, you know, sets of experiences as you can, so that when it comes time to do that, that was like what my naive kind of like young person's brain yep. was kind of like pushing for. Did you have something like that? Yeah, I mean, and look, I wouldn't say it's naive. I think we all, when we we have our our goals, I, um, yeah, I wanted to open a restaurant of my own, and I had all, and you, as I'm sure you did as well, we all do. I had so many books, and I wrote down all my ideas, and like, oh, I'm going to do this, and I would just come up with like all these ideas of things that I wanted to make, and I was always constantly thinking about like, okay, I'm going to use this when I open up my spot. I'm going to use this when I open up my spot. Coincidentally, I ended up opening a fast casual <laughs> restaurant that focused on hot dogs which I never would have thought of. Um, but the goal along, you know, when I started cooking was like, I want to be, you know, the best chef in the world. And as you know, um, there's something to that that's just really special that if you haven't cooked in those restaurants is, um, uh, it, it just, it's an intangible thing where you just, you, you, you know that you have to work harder than everybody that you have to learn so much technique and you have to be prepared to just get, you know, um, you know, yell that and keep moving forward and be persistent and, you know, work for free on your days off and come in early and stay late. And I love that. It was just, um, I just loved that, that idea of like, Oh, wait a second. I can, the only thing that differentiates me from everybody else around me is just how much harder I work and how, how can I sort of absorb information, you know, faster. So it comes time when you're kind of you know, not, not leaving the industry, quote unquote, but you're going from this kind of like, I call it from chef to founder. And I think that there's a lot of similarities there from like taking responsibility and being a leader, but I don't think enough chefs pause in their careers to acknowledge that there are like cooking skills and then there are entrepreneurship skills and the entrepreneurship skills don't get taught always in the way in kitchens of like, here's a recipe. You're going to stand over my shoulder and watch this stuff. It's almost, almost, I would experience it where like, you can't be in the finance meetings. HR happens just with these two people, you know, like, and so you, you end up having a lot of these notebooks with great ideas and you know how to make sauces and you know how to butcher, but then it's like, you go on to start opening your own thing and you're like, Oh my God, there's a, there's a gap here. Did you experience that gap? Oh my gosh. A hundred percent. You're totally right. I think the they're, they're diametrically opposed, the, the, the skill set of being a chef and being an entrepreneur. Now, there's a lot of parallels, and I've seen more and more over the years, the idea that you, you if you don't love it, you're just not going to succeed because being an entrepreneur is just freaking hard. So is being a chef. Technique is so important, and the same thing happens, you know, is, is true. And as to be an entrepreneur, you have to, you have to understand your craft and, and your domain. Um, but, but there's just there's such a different skill set. I think the biggest skill set, I think, or – not even skill set, but the mindset shift from being a chef to being, uh, you know, a restaurant owner is your metric of success is not how well you cook a piece of meat, but how well can you deploy a team to do that consistently every day and make it profitable and have people coming in the door that love, it, right? Which is different. Like I can cook a, you know, a, a chicken, like, you know, with my eyes closed and make it perfect every time. Um, but who cares if my cook can't do it, right? Uh, and if they're not happy doing it. Totally. So you acknowledge that gap. Were you the type of person that just kind of like uh, uh, tried to find a school that had like some online courses on entrepreneurship? Did you dive into books? Did you have a mentor that you could call? Like, how did you how did you start to bridge that gap? What resources were helpful for you? Yeah, so um, it was mostly books. And I would say it's a little bit different when I opened restaurants as opposed to when I started the, you know, my, my new company, which is a technology company, because opening restaurants, it was tough because, you know, when I opened up Bark, I had, you know, a, a few restaurants called Bark in New York and I went from being in the fine dining world to opening restaurants in the, in the sort of fast, casual, almost like QSR space. And I didn't have anybody to talk to about that because it, just, it, it didn't exist back then. Now it's, 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 it's somewhat common, but back then nobody, um, did that, and m most of the chefs that I that I worked for, like Floyd Cardo, as I remember, um, being upset. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you opening a fast casual restaurant? And so I didn't really have a lot of guidance. Greg Coombs was very helpful to me, just as a mentor, um, and, and and by the way, so was, so was Floyd. Um, it, it, in general, and there's a lot of lessons as a chef that you learn along the way that translate really well. Um, so I tried to sort of like 
culminate all of those into the into the business skills. But a lot of it is just really learning learning as you go, you know, and you kind of have to. Um, there are some incredible books that, that that I would recommend for entrepreneurship, um, but you know. There's no real like substitute for just getting in and doing it, you know. I mean, my, my, my audience would completely annihilate me if I didn't ask for some of those. It, it is part of a rapid fire question later on in the show, but like if you have books that come to mind, because you know uh, this is a voracious reading kind of audience. Like anything you recommend, people will kind of like pick pick and choose what what suits their needs for now. Uh, I mean, I, I have a ton. I think it depends on like the the vantage of what you're trying to do as it relates to the restaurants specifically um there's not a lot of books that i read about like how to run a great restaurant i mean i think setting the table by dan by by danny meyer is great um but most of the books that 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 i've read that really stick with me are books that maybe have been relegated more to sort of technology world but definitely apply to starting a restaurant business i'm I'm the same things like i'm the same like i'm trying to pull up some some books that i like i have like rework uh lean startup like uh, yep. there's, a, there's another yeah, business model book great. underneath there. Like, I don't. So the funny thing about restaurant folks is that when it's time to when it's book time, publishers usually want to kind of like I would feel like nudge you more towards like share your recipes, share your philosophy on on food. And you know I've had guests that co- that come on the show that's like chefs don't share their business models enough. And so I think that like I did the same thing. I would look to. Silicon Valley people who, you know, are, are bloggers who are writing about how like business structure ends up working and any of the little things that you need to kind of be, you know, have top of mind with like marketing and sales, like there's other people who are incentivized to put their ideas out there about those topics. And so it's almost like you have to kind of like go off the map, gather these resources and bring them back to what you, whatever you're doing. And so, yeah, like I, I, no expectation to share like, oh, what chef restaurant book ended up helping you? Because like, Genuinely, I recommend these books all the time because the, the quality of the information translates regardless. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the ones you mentioned are great. I think you know, you know, E Myth is a great one. I love so Crossing good. the Chasm. High Output Management by Andy Grove is an incredible one. Um, Play Bigger. Um, uh, I mean, there's there's. There's there's a ton. I, I would I would probably like you know have to, uh, yeah the mythical man month is a great one. Um, that's really more. It, it's funny because it, it, it's like a technology book, but it really helps you understand how to build uh, an entire organization. Um, and you know I I, I think that you know there, there's a couple that like seem like very like like why would you why would you associate that with business? But there's there's one book called Fooled by Randomness uh, that I really like to just help me to sort of understand. Um, just thought process and how to think differently. Uh, one of my favorite books is Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Uh, I know there's some controversy around him, but um, his sort of approach to, to um, you know, competition, I think, is 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 brilliant. Um, so I read I, I read that one a lot. I was, by the way, I also read Sid Hartha like once a year um, because it's just such a, a, a great sort of um, way to think about like the simplicity of what like what really matters and how much you can do if you just can control kind of like um, you know, your mind. Um, so that's, that one I recommend to everybody, um, you know, for sure. Huge. You have a interesting story that, uh, I found on you as I was doing some research where, where you were working one day and you were keeping track of all these ideas and you mentioned this already, but, but you ended up losing that notebook and that could have potentially, you know, at, at least prompted or, or encouraged the founding of, of something like Mies. And so, can you tell a little bit? Of, can you give some background on that story of losing your notebook and why that's so frustrating, and then potentially lead into you know introducing Mies as a as a company? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, look like like you know, uh, we all had these little black notebooks that we kept in our pocket, and it was everything you wrote down the recipes that you were working on, and when you're at the restaurant, you would write down you know the, the recipes you had to make, uh, and then a lot of us, you know, me included, I would write down um, all my ideas. Um, and so I was working for Floyd Cardoza at Tabla at the time. This was like 2003. Mm-hmm. And in the morning, again, I always had a couple jobs. And so in the morning, I worked for free making salumi for um, uh, Mario Batali had a salumi shop in, in the city uh, in, in this place called Italian Wine Merchants. And this really incredible chef named Dan Latham was running the program there. And so I would just come in the mornings and, you know, I would spend an hour cleaning intestines. And then he would teach me everything, you know, like how to make copa and prosciutto and pancetta and lomo and 
you know, all the temperature and time and humidity and the recipes, of course. And, and, um, and I had all of that in this book, everything, like every little detail of it. And, and I, I, I might have a different approach now, but back then uh, I just literally just documented everything. I probably should have absorbed more, but like the little details, I would just write it down. So I make sure I didn't forget. Um, and then one day I was staging on my day off, uh, for fun at this place called Veritas, which, um, at the time it was a chef named Scott Bryan that was there and just, you know, it was my day off. I wanted to just check out another restaurant because we used to do that back in the day. Uh, it doesn't happen so much anymore. And I lost the notebook there and it had everything from that, um, you know, from, from what I was working on with, uh, with Chef Latham as, as well as a bunch of stuff from Tabla and just ideas. And I was just devastated. And, um, and it, it, again, it, it was a bit of a novel idea back then because yeah, I didn't know about Evernote. I don't think it existed. Um, and so it was just, the, the novel idea was I want to digitize all, all my recipes and my ideas. I never want to lose them again. Um, it's, it obviously has grown into so much more than that. Uh, but that was the initial sort of impetus for, hey, let's like, it wouldn't be cool if there was sort of a digital recipe, you know, tool. So, so, <clears throat> so many threads to kind of pull on there. You mentioned you would probably go about documenting all those details differently now. Is that because of how you've built Mies? Or do you think that there's something that like before that where you're like, oh, this wasn't actually all that organized or I was being a little bit too nitpicky or, I mean, I think about it now as like, I should have written it almost like an SOP versus kind of like, you know, like I, I should have just done it in a way where I could come back to it like two years down the line having no, cause I felt fell into that trap too, where you just, you just write the words 87 C as like, that's the cooking temperature or something like that. And you're like, there's no other context to this. And then you go back to it and you're like, Oh yeah. my God, I can't remember why 87 C is like this. Uh, so yeah. yeah, well that, I mean, yes, that's part of it for sure. I mean, partly like, Half the time when I write notes, to be honest with you, I don't even know what I wrote. Yeah. I, my handwriting is so terrible that I literally can't read it. And so I'm like, I have no idea what that is, whether it was my idea or something I'm writing down. Um, but partly I would say, you know, that I, I, I may have erred more on the side of just like write everything down that you remembered right away. And I, not that, that that's not that that's bad, um, but you probably absorb less because you're focusing on like, remember, you know, remembering that thing and documenting as opposed to like looking and, and, and saying, you know, like, oh, okay, got it. This is the premise of it. Because especially with, you know, in this case, it was charcuterie. There are some sort of common sort of methodologies and approaches, you know, to percentages of of nitrates and how you think about a brine versus a dry and things like that, 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 you know, if you understand those, you don't necessarily need the full recipe. Um, so uh, I think that that was just another thing that, that, that sort of hit me. So what was the kind of time gap between that moment and like, getting a what what you would consider to be like the v1 of me is kind of like out there yep so i mean uh, to be honest it was, it was it was the culmination of a number of things that happened over the years that sort of um kept hitting a little extra notch on the belt of like oh okay okay and then finally you know once i um owned my own restaurants i realized like oh gosh we need this thing but you know over the years like you know, like in every restaurant, you know this as well, like our recipes are stored in all kinds of crazy ways and it's very unorganized. They're typically also very, not very explicit. And so, so often, you know, you have the wrong version of a sauce. And it's like, what are you doing? That's not, that's not the gastric we use now. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it was one that was in the recipe book. So, you know, that would happen. And then I remember when I left Tabla and went to Boulay, there were no recipes and like, uh, they would write them on parchment paper, and I remember Evan Rich like documenting the palm puree, on the, you know, with the, the 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 ratios on a parchment paper. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is things that we are famous for, and there's not even a recipe for it. Um, and there's no excuse for that, you know. It's like it's not like, oh, you just need to learn how to do it. Like, no, like document the process, document how it works. So that would happen, and then you know, I, I remember Cafe Gray, uh, Chef Kuntz and I used to do these events, and we were flying to Montreal for the Festival in Lumiere, and like you know, you would you would share a kitchen with another with another restaurant, and they would help you, um, you know, produce. And so we were doing this whole truffle tasting menu. And I made all these videos and, and mailed them a fucking DVD Whoa. of how to do this thing. Um, and so we would, we, like, I, I, like, recorded, like, like my, you know, myself making, you know, the, the truffle bouillon and how to sort of, like, you know, preserve the truffles. And this is how I want to clean the veal breasts and all these things. And I'm like, this is crazy uh, that the, I'm sending this on a, on a, on a you know. Uh, so anyway, so that that, that happened. And then. And then, you know, once I opened up the, my own restaurants, 
and I had to start sort of managing a team and, and it was very high volume. Um, you know, I realized like, there's just not, there's no tool built for us. Um, and, uh, you know, the only thing that we had, and back then there wasn't even that many inventory systems, but now like there's a lot of them, like the only we have is inventory software and it's almost like offensive. It's like, that's not recipe software. That's inventory software. It's different, you know? And, and, um, and so I just, that, that was when I like, you know, about six years into bark, I was like, all right, I'm done. I, uh, I think I'll have a bigger impact if I, if I can build this thing that I'm, that I'm dreaming up. And so I sort of divested from the, from the restaurant business, um, sort of, because I actually then went and ran a restaurant group, but, um, but we can get into that if you want, uh, and realize like, you know, we just, I just need to build this tool because I think that everybody needs it. What was your, what was there like a, 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 you thought it was going to turn out to be the inventory solution of the entire restaurant industry and it's transformed into something else? Or did you think it was going to be, I'm, 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 I'm struck by, I don't know if you're familiar with this app called, um, it's like getting hello hype on Instagram right now. It's called Granda. And I think it's out of Switzerland and it's like very, like a lot of videos and recipes, but it's like, come here to get inspired where I think when I think of me is it's like, use this to be more organized, use this to be more collaborative, use this to keep track of stuff better. And you know, the digitization yeah. piece, like, did you think Mies was going to be one thing and it transformed to be something else? Or like, was this always the goal? No, this was really, I like, honestly, since day one, it's always been the goal. Like I knew I didn't want to build an inventory, like ERP system. And every recipe app out there is either like, go find recipes here, which as a chef, you know, like, okay, fine, but no, that's not what we're doing. And, um, and you know, it's not like we're going to use an inventory system to like, to, to, you know, at per se, you are not like, you're not, you're not going to your inventory system to look at like how to make oysters and pearls, right? That's exactly. Um, so, uh, it was sort of the, you know, it was crystallized pretty early on, like what I wanted to build. And, um, I, I will say that, you know, when I moved on from, from Bark, the restaurant that I owned, I partnered with this restaurant group called Orify, um, because I knew that they were, I mean, like they were very well capitalized and very sophisticated in the way that they ran restaurants, uh, and they had scale. And so, you know, the, the, the hypothesis was for me at that point, like, okay, well, if I partner with them, I will also learn this sort of new, like this other part of the business, which is, you know, restaurants at, 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 um, at scale, with the different types of, you know, different types of throughputs and what does it look like when you, you know, um, when you scale those across the country. Uh, and so making sure the tool works for all these different types of, of, you know, restaurants. And so, um, it was within that sort of, um, ecosystem that I built the tool and that then caused the tool to sort of evolve a bit more than I had originally planned because I didn't know enough at the time before then about how, uh, inventory systems and ERP systems work, and yeah, serendipitously, I I I became an expert because I tested every single inventory system you could think of and onboarded new ones and was you know sold on all these other ones, and so I I I, I developed a deep understanding for how they work and deficiencies as it relates to recipes and recipe costing and and all the other things that we do, uh, and so that was really you know I was lucky to to have done that because the tool then became more than just uh, a recipe tool uh, for, you know, storing and organizing your, your content uh, and training your team. Um, but in my opinion, the easiest and best way that, to get recipe costs and all the other things that you need to do uh, because of all the deficiencies that I saw in, in that tool. You use this word, or you have used this word before, called operational empathy, this, this kind of phrase. And I think it's so key to how you kind of like navigated that process where it's, I think a lot of, and, and chefs can be like this sometimes with, with certain ideas, call it a product, call it a concept. It's like, oh, I'm going to work in the shadows until this is like, in my mind, 98% there, and then I'm going to announce it. But I think that the, the, the thing that chefs could learn a little bit better from, call it startup land or, or, or tech just as an industry in general, is like the idea of a minimum viable product and test it relentlessly with like these first few users, or in your case, like yeah. call it a client, like get get the get the rubber to meet the road and then iterate from there i mean i mean did you did you did you consciously know that that was happening or was that just like a natural evolution of like oh cool like someone can actually use this i might as well give it a try so you know just to be honest i really screwed up in the beginning i i didn't even know what an mvp was <laughs> sure. and i used my own money to start like you know hiring developers to build this product 
And very quickly, I mean, you know this as a chef, right? Chefs are very particular. Uh, and so I very quickly got feedback from chefs like, what the heck is this? Nah, nah, man, I'm not using this. And so I was like, okay, step back a second, right? Let's assume I have all these cognitive biases about like how I perceive recipes and all the things that are needed. And also let's just strip the, like any sort of um, assumption that like anybody will know um, what is supposed to happen if it's not built, you know, very, you know, very intuitively into the app. And so I scrapped that first, you know, product and spent a year just interviewing everybody I knew, um, every chef I knew and every chef that they knew, uh, about what do you use? Like what, where do you put your recipes? What do you like? What do you like? What do you hate? Like, you know, what do you, what do you want to see? Um, where, where else do they live? All those kinds of things. And, um, and that's what we use to then build uh, you know, the first product. The operational empathy really is is the bedrock of everything that we do in Mies. So I'm a big believer in first principle thinking and you know creating autonomy within the organization. And so um, I know that we can't have chefs working at Mies, you know, in, like in perpetuity for all the positions that we do. There are a lot of chefs that work at Mies. Um, so because of that, you know, the, we have these first principles. The number one, the first, the first of the first principles being operational empathy. And what it means is that whether you're a developer or your customer success or support or marketing or sales, we don't have salespeople, but, um, you know, engineering or product, um, it is of the utmost importance that you understand how chefs operate, right? Because most people, and you know this, like, especially like in the, in the software world, they don't, they don't realize that like, you know, don't, first of all, don't call somebody at 11 a.m. Um, because they're getting ready for service. Um, you know, definitely don't like schedule something for, you know, for, for noon on a, on a Wednesday. Um, and, and, and that's just little things, but then you have to, you have to assume that like, there's not, they're not just going to be able to like be in isolation using this thing. There's going to be deliveries coming in. Someone's going to show up late. Someone's going to cut their finger and you know, the, the scallops are going to be better to throw them out. And, all those things, if you're not, if you haven't been in kitchens, you don't know, and then you won't build a product, and you won't, you know, pro- provide a service uh, that's empathetic to all those things that we that we go through. Because I mean, you could have built it to be like this super beautiful, you know, like uh, look, looks great to screenshot and share on a landing page of a website, but it's like, yeah, a little bit to your point, like if if the chef sees that and is like, in no way, shape, or form can me or my team use that. Uh, uh, th- then, then what's the point? I, I had a question about beliefs and, and you kind of touched on this already, but it, it is a perfect segue. Do you see some common, what I'm going to call them as beliefs that chefs have to need to either, they either need to change them or they need to have them in place in order to use Mies to its fullest potential? Yeah. So th- th- there's probably one, I mean, in general, look, there's a, there's a paradigm shift that we are, you know, that, that, that we are working on um, in that like recipes, you know, up until now have all lived in disparate other systems like, you know, non-domain specific systems like Google Docs, Google Sheets, things like that. So first and foremost, of course, you have to, you know, um, believe that there can be a better way because I think there's a lot of distrust because um, everything that we've been given to date has sucked. Um, so there's that. But I think as it relates to the culinary world, I do think, and sometimes, you know, you know, people get upset about this, but um, recipes are important. I think that there's a lot of times there's a notion that like, and I hear this sometimes with chefs, by the way, not from great chefs. Uh, and very typically, it's not, you know, you don't hear it from like, um, you know, and, and you hear it less and less now, but recipes are important. The idea that I don't use recipes and it's all in my head. Well, good for you. If you want to work for yourself and only be you in the kitchen all the time and never have any employees, um, and even then you might not make it, you know, the same tomorrow, uh, then recipes do matter, right? And if you have a vision, if you're a chef, no matter, you know, you have a, a vision to have a three-star Michelin restaurant, right? You have this vision and your envision, your vision cannot be implicit. It has to be explicit, right? Because your gastrique is different from the next person's and or your adaptation of it, right? And so you have to explain that. Like, why do you reduce this vinegar two-thirds the way and not half the way or crash it to sec? Uh, and what are you going to do with it next? And is it supposed to be chilled first? Is it going through a tammy? Is it going, you know, all those things that they just leave out. And you put a recipe that just has ingredients and, like, you know, one or two instructions. Um, you have to believe that that's not enough, right? That, that, that like, 
your team deserves more. They need more, and they're going to be more successful if you if, if you if you do that. Um, so I think that that's that's important. Uh, and, and I would say that's independent of Mies. <laughs> I would say we just need to believe that. But I, I think, spe- especially as it relates to Mies, I think that's important. It's so common. I mean, and and I think it it might potentially be uh, to that, sh- that that question that every chef hates getting asked, which is like, what's your specialty, or what's your like, what's your signature dish? Like nobody likes getting asked that in the, okay. in the early days. But as you start to and and I like this hit me like square in the face when I like left from being basically a chef to cuisine at a restaurant to like going to open my own thing and start my own pop-ups. It was such a safety blanket to be able to say like, Oh, well, I don't have a signature dish when I was like, you know, in, in the prior days to me taking like full responsibility for the food and and all those sorts of things. And again, it like, I hit that wall where I was like, Oh my God, like you need to shed that. And you need to like start to lean into the fact that like recipes need to be a thing. You need to come up with your way for doing things. And then not only that, but like the important part now is to kind of like teach this and be able to like transfer that delegation is the actual the actual word that 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 is being used there. But yeah, like it, and that's why I call it a belief uh, uh, change or, or a, a, an adjustment in kind of like how you how you approach your work because. If you don't, you're going to be that person who just consistently gets caught up and can never scale. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as it relates to um, a business, you know, customer retention is all about. And I and I I sort of always relate customer retention to trust. And I'm a big believer that trust equals consistency plus time, right? And the key there is consistency, right? And you can't have a consistent product if you haven't documented how that product is supposed to be made. And I think that gets forgotten a lot. You have to create consistency or, or people are going to be scared to come back. And then there's just, look, there's just matter of fact things with recipes that, uh, that you need and that are just going to be far more healthy. If I'm going to make a nuak cham, right? Um, like, uh, you know, a Vietnamese, you know, fish sauce, I, uh, table sauce, then yeah, there's a ratio of lime juice and fish sauce and garlic and chilies. And yeah, I can wing it, but I perfected like a ratio that I really like. And I want to use that again, you know, and the same thing with a lot of these things that we do, a lot of, especially, of course, with like sauces and things like that. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time dialing in, you know, the amount of each of these things and how much chili. And, and of course, you can then sort of like iterate from there. Uh, but you have to have that base, you know. Let's say that someone is has either found this show based on uh, uh, searching your name and, and they're a new user of Mies and they're just like, hey, I'm kind of interested in what the founder has to say about this product. Or someone is hearing of this product for the first time and just potentially like is scrolling the landing page right now and, uh, you know, potentially thinking about giving it a try. What are some examples that you've seen of like great power user usages of Mies to just kind of give, paint the picture of kind of like what this looks like being used properly and intentionally and at, at, at like the highest level. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, um, Mies should be the source of truth of all your culinary IP, right? Like all of your recipes and all of your content should, be, should live in there and then it should be disseminated to your team. And that's how the technology is built, right? So that you can disseminate to your team and, you know, someone can have view access and someone can have edit access to different things. And whenever you update something, everybody gets notified in real time. Hey, this sauce was updated. It's got more sugar in it now. Uh, so you always have the right, you know, the, the right, um, you know, recipe in front of everybody, every cook's hands. And, um, so, the, so the source of truth, you know, of, of the content is one of the most important things. And I think it, it, it feels innocuous as a, as a product value prop, but it, but it's, it's really, really important because, you know, as you, as you know, in kitchens, you know, it gets really scary when two people have a different <laughs> recipe. Um, and then, you know, we just sort of double down on that with everything else, right? Like, like, okay, now I'm using this recipe and with every recipe app that's out there, um, you know, if you want to make you know, uh, a scaled up version of that recipe, well, maybe you can make a 2x or a 3x and, and you're limited in that capacity. But then also, like, if you scale it up, or scale it down, you know, maybe it says like 0.045 cups or something or 317 teaspoons, and nobody can measure that. So we built logic around like converting units where we actually measure them in the, you know, um, in the kitchen. And then we also know that, you know, life isn't perfect. And when you make a tomatillo salsa, uh, and your recipe calls for 4,500 grams of tomatillos, 
and you get your case tome tios and and after you clean them turns out you only have you know whatever four thousand nine hundred and eleven grams or something that's that's more than that yeah. but you know you can you can you can scale your recipe based on any ingredient so if you're running low on something you can you can scale the entire recipe in one click um no work on your end it's all built in for you and that's because um of not just the, the scaling technology but um you know the hardest part about getting recipes into any system is that there's so much information that you need to put in in, in addition to your recipe you have to put in how much loss when you peel an onion or how much does a cup of shredded you know uh, radishes weigh or you know how much is dark rye flour weigh versus a you know uh you know a, a, all-purpose flour and what is the conversion between those things and and um you know what are the allergens associated with tahini versus this all that is like things that you have to put in that have nothing to do with you cooking uh, and so we just got rid of all that we just said we're going to build that in for you and so we hired rdns and i had all my chefs on staff at my restaurants and we spent years just like building out that database so when you create a recipe all that's just you know built in for you so you just focus on like the you know like putting in a good recipe and we'll make sure that it's costed right you can you convert it you can scale it and you can you know see nutrition and allergens and all that jazz what about in the uh and forgive me if if this is just something i'm unaware of but like in the development process of a new dish like how does that work with me's if i have an idea to make you know kind of like a a, a braised pork belly dish with a tomatillo salsa like how does that work yep yes yeah, so there's a lot of stuff we're doing on that like my so um uh I always was fascinated by Airbnb's um, like approach to um, to experience, and they had like this eleven star experience. And, Amazing exercise! You know. Can you actually explain that to people? Because I've I've done that. I, so when I was doing pop ups, I did that with my team as like describe an eleven star experience. So valuable. So can can you explain that for people who haven't done that before? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Brian Chesky obviously would do a better job of, of explaining this. But the idea being like, okay, you know, a five star experience is that you know my my airbnb is ready for me and the key is there and the apartment's clean right and then you know an eight star experience i get there the apartment's clean and they know that i like uh this show on netflix and it's like playing when i get there and they know that i love you know dark chocolate almonds and those are in the in the fridge for me and then you know the 11 star experience is that you know i get flown to the to the city and there's and there's a parade waiting for me and you know they're going to take me to the to the to the airbnb and my favorite chef is bringing me the food and you know they sort of think about like okay what would this look like you know at at at, at its best uh what would be at like maybe the impossible to like the, to the basics to the table stakes and you know i i do the same thing with me's right we're, we're constantly incrementally building to what this you know the the, the 11 star experience will be right now what it means is you can document your ideas in the docs we built this thing called docs which you can document ideas they're all searchable and um and shareable and then you can convert those into a recipe and then you can take that recipe and of course when we make a recipe let's just say that we're going to make you know um you know a uh, uh some sort of whatever some sort of sauce right we're gonna make a small amount we're probably going to make like 220 grams of this sauce right but then for sure, when we make it in the restaurant, you know, uh, uh, for service, we're probably going to make four quarts of it, right? So we built technology that allows you to take that 200 gram, you know, um, you know, batch that you made and scale it up and make that the new one times batch. And uh, we we created sort of R and D um, like bifurcations so that you can create recipes that you're working on and none of your team can see them. So if you have a new salsa verde and everybody else has the live one, uh, then they won't see the one you're working on unless you want them to. Uh, so they always, uh, you know, you can be working in the background while there's new things going on that's today right the the future state is um you know i'm working on a dish clearly like i have you know whether it's an I, iphone or an ipad or um any device and i just start talking okay i'm adding 20 grams of shallots and it adds that for me uh because it's connected to the scale maybe i don't even need to say that when i put in 20 grams of shallots now that's added to my recipe um and i might have an idea uh because i'm at a restaurant and i think about something and now i can draw down that idea uh and that gets added to my recipe as a you know as a picture and just thinking about from inception when does the inception of the idea happen uh and how do we carry that all the way through to a, a recipe that's live in the restaurant executed by my team um, so that's 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 how I think about this sort of like uh, the journey of how this will, will work as we you know keep going on, which means IoT devices, which means uh, more OCR technology, and um, you know and touch you know touch screen and voice activation and things like that. 
Are there any other kind of like changes in the industry that have been either percolating away that, that, that have been kind of like everybody thought that we were going to be like in VR glasses by now, kind of like, uh, what was that? Like the, the Heston Blumenthal, like sound of the sea, like to the nth degree, uh, you know, like we're going to be shown movies with our food, uh, to like, you know, robotic replacements, like, like where does your head go with, with, you know, are there things you're keeping an eye out on or, or things that you've seen that's like, Oh, that's, that's not, that's not ever going to happen because X, Y, Z. Yeah, I, I tend to be more of like a, a pragmatist or like a realist for like the, the short term. I mean, the culinary industry, you know, for better or for worse, is is pretty um, – um, our, our adoption curve is pretty is, is pretty low right now, right? We have a ways to go before, um, you know, that technology is really deployed into the in, – into, you know, into a, a ubiquitous part of, of, of the culinary industry. Uh, so things like robots, for example, I think that there is a future for them. But you have to, again, this goes back to operational empathy. You have to have the infrastructure to put those robots into your restaurant, which means you have to build your restaurant that way. So that means that every single restaurant today that exists would need to rebuild uh, in order to, you know, facilitate putting robots into their into their kitchens. So that's going to be a long while, right? The, the long tail on that is probably 20, 30 years, right? Um, and that's robots. I think the VR, AR, that technology is starting to get better. Um, so there's opportunity there, I think probably in terms of collaboration in the metaverse and things like that, I get dizzy in the metaverse right now. So I think there's probably still a ways to go. The, the, the VR that has been deployed to date has been very kitschy. Like there's some restaurants that do like, you can look at the table and there's a thing and that's, it's a, it's novelty. Um, but I think that there's some collaboration opportunities long-term, you know, that said, there are people way smarter than me. McDonald's is buying real estate in the metaverse. So there's something that they know that I don't, um, I think about more sort of like tactical, like you know, advancements in what we call technology that are really just advancements in, what, in how we do things, like the gig economy. I think the gig economy has definitely um, changed our industry, right? Chefs can do a lot more than just be, you know, um, confined to these four wall boxes, right? Because you can start a business or, you know, partner with a company like Chef or Food Gnome or Cook Unity, and you don't need four walls all the time, right? And I think that's actually been a big um a big change in the industry and i think what we'll see over the next 10 years is um a change in the medium in which um like people consume our our food right it's always been restaurants now it's delivery i think what you're going to start to see is really good food in places where it used to suck like hospitals like um you know institutional places like schools um you know airports uh, where all that used to be terrible food, I think it's going to start getting good. Let's 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 hope so because there's a lot of people who, I mean, like so my wife my wife's a pharmacist and the the food at her clinic is is not great and uh, you know she married a chef so that's that's part 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 benefit for her but there's a lot of people who don't you know get to experience good food on the day to day which is like really sad like if we're being honest um, yeah it's not, a, it's not a good way to live. I'm curious when when you go out now, like having gone through this entire career that you've had, like how do you experience restaurants now? Um, well, I think <laughs> empathy definitely plays a part, especially today because of COVID. Um, I I look at these, you know, at, at not just the chefs but the entire staff. They're just, I mean, it's really heroic what <laughs> what's happening. I know it seems like um, silly to say that, but it is not easy. And, you know, there is definitely, like, risk involved. It's still just as hard, if not way harder than before. So I'm just – I'm, I'm even more grateful than ever before when I do go out. Um, I will say, you know, I have two kids. Um, and so the amount of times I actually go out for a dinner is <laughs> not nearly as much. Um, so um, my wife and I just had a great meal at Kamika. Uh, shout out to Christine Lau uh, last uh, – a couple of days ago. That was That was fantastic. But – before that, I think the last meal we had was <laughs> two months, two months prior. Um, but when I do go out, I tend to, um, I tend to try and have something for the chef, uh, if not then something that gets said to them because, um, um, you know, it's it's a, they're they're putting themselves um, through a lot to to do what they do for us, and I think people don't really appreciate um, how much work goes into, and you know this with your background. No, it's it's very hard for for diners to really understand the amount of effort and time and money um, and thought that went into getting that plate on your, uh, you know, on your table. 
it's this is so we we could have done this in New York. I was in New York last week, believe it or not, and I was walking mm. around East Village, Soho. I don't I don't remember exactly where it was, but I didn't know that Bumble, the dating app, had a had a has a wine bar cafe concept. Like, is there a world where Mies would have like open a, a restaurant? concept someday yeah absolutely that's that's definitely something I, I, uh in my sort of um uh in in the pipeline of what i've been thinking about for a number of reasons one um i love the idea of an innovation sort of like lab a restaurant where chefs can come and test things and obviously test out me's but test out lots of technology and lots of different products and and just you know people that are breaking barriers or breaking boundaries to come together in one place and and um you know put out great great product and test things together um almost like a community uh and for me like the idea of having that like below our offices would be fucking incredible so uh i don't know if i can curse yeah. on this podcast, but you can it's uh, far away but but uh but but yeah I, I i would love that would you i mean like is there still a hospitality bone in your body where you know like in 20, 20 years when I've kind of like, you know, everything is coasting and I'm just kind of like, I can be the person that walks around tables and just like pour champagne to people. Like, is there anything left of that for you? Or do you just kind of like you host dinner parties at home to kind of scratch that itch? Like, um, no, I actually, um, I, I already have something that I'm, I'm planning up where I, I live in Westchester. Yeah. Um, it, it will, it will never go away for me. The funny thing is, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I look at. I, I'm excited to 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 cook. Uh, I think the next venture that I do will be something that I do um, almost as like my uh, as just my way of enjoying my time because uh, I because I love it. Uh, obviously, I would have a team that would help execute because it's it's a you know it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, but um, yeah, it's that it, it's certainly something that, that that I've been dabbling with, and I think you know. Uh, not today because I just I'm buried with uh, with this and it will be for a while. Uh, but I'll certainly open up something again. I love that. I have a a you can you can frame this in the context of me's. You can frame this in the context of any of the of the uh, restaurant concepts or, or openings where you were in charge of hiring specifically. But I I call this the meta job interview question. So you're sitting down with a an applicant and you you ask them a question. It's not necessarily what you what their answer is. It's you're looking for something else in that person's answer. What do you what do you look for as you're kind of like hiring? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a, there's a couple questions that I ask everybody um, everybody that I ever hire, uh, and the first one is what is the biggest accomplishment that you've ever uh, achieved uh, professionally? Uh, and what I'm looking for there is how they explain it. And how they are complicit in that, uh, in, in, you know, in whatever that they achieved and what and if they can sort of quantify the results. Right. Because a lot of times people will um, talk about something that happened and they were a part of a team that did it and and they had a, a, a role. Um, but I'm looking for someone that understands that they need to measure like something that was achieved. Like what was, you know, what, what was the result of that? And that they specifically, you know, um, you know, executed that thing. And um, cor correct me and, if I'm wrong there, but like a bad answer might be like, and it was really cool, right? Like that, that's, that, that would be a, that would be a bad answer yeah. or, a, or a bad answer would be, um, oh, we, um, increased sales by, you know, 400%, uh, over the, you know, over the course of the year. Um, and when I say, oh, great, how, how did you do that? Uh, and then they say, well, there was a sales team to this and the marketing team to this, and I, you know, developed the, the, the landing page for the thing. And I'm like, okay, so, um, you know, I would, in that, it, that might be something that is a, a great achievement, but I would, what I would want to hear is that I developed a landing page and I did 10 AB tests. And it turns out that this landing page has 82%, you know, higher conversion rate. So once I did that, we saw conversion rate increase by this much and da, 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 da. cool. But you know, I think, you know, when, when I'm, when I'm asking this question, what I'm looking for is like, how do they perceive uh, like their impact on, on, on their work? So that question I, I ask every single person. And the one I ask also is just, you know, uh, and what the one that's the most important for me, to be honest with you, um, is like, what inspires you every day? Like what, what would, what would make you excited to get up every morning? Um, because like too often I, I find that it's, Either the answer is nebulous, 
um, or it is actually something that doesn't have to do with the role that they're that they're applying for, and it's a it's a lose lose. So, what else? Any any other uh, kind of things that you look for, and and you know maybe maybe the question the the better question in your case might be like, what have you had to come to terms with, kind of like changing going from restaurants to kind of like this more tech focused business. Yeah. Well, I, what I'll say, and this, this, this might relate to it, but, but um, I've developed this sort of philosophy over the years in terms of management that really is a product of all the things that I screwed up um, is that I, I believe firmly that, and it, this sounds, the connotation sounds bad, but it's, it's, it's not intended to be that everything is my fault, right? As a leader, everything is my fault. Uh, and, and there's five, Anytime somebody on my team did something wrong, one of five things happened. Either I hired the wrong person, right? Or I hired them for the wrong role. Uh, I didn't manage them well, the way they need to be managed. I didn't train them well. Like I didn't give them the resources that they need. Um, I didn't inspire them with my vision. Like I didn't, I didn't make it clear enough, you know, what the vision is like for, you know, for what we, what we're doing. Um, or I didn't, um, you know, give them clear enough objectives of what, you know, of what success means and which is really just part of managing anyways. And so if, if one of the, if they did something wrong, it's all, it's 99.9% of the time, one of those things, you know, there aren't really bad apples, uh, in this world. Um, there are people that are in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong role, um, or that they, they just need to be, you know, uh, manage a different way, or some people need more aggressive, some people need more passive. Uh, and so that has helped me a lot and, and created a lot of solace in knowing that, like, um, I can always just go and blame myself. Um, and uh, it, look, it does mean sometimes I have to let the person go or, or um, you know, move them to a different role. Um, but it helps in sort of um, creating that ownership for myself. And, and the hope is that then I instill that in my team that, like, I'll always take the, the, the blame and I hope that they will as well. I think an interesting point for the the leaders that are listening who kind of push back on that, where it's like, uh, yeah, but so-and-so actually properly fucked up that day. I think that that, that what you're hopefully saying and what the, what the takeaway for someone who hasn't experienced is kind of like taking accountability as part of their modi, modus operandi might be like, sure, it might be a, a problem that happened, but you, can you ask yourself, how did I kind of like impact this or how, how can part of this be considered like, don't d dip your toe in is what I'm trying to say. Like how could yeah. there be some part of this where I had a, had a, had a, had a part in this. And this is speaking to the person who is just like, it's always my team. Like it's always their fault. Like, like it's just a horrible place to be. Yeah. And there's all, and, and there's always going to be a, um, you, you'll always find something. I'm a big uh, believer in, in stoicism. Um, and there's some really great, you know, books about that. Meditations is, is a great one. Um, and um, one sort of, I, I, it's funny because I have on my computer a lot of these stoic sort of, you know, quotes that I just like have revolving every day. And, and one of them is just, is just literally asking yourself, how am I complicit in, in, in the environment that I've created? And you can always find, you know, some reason why, even if they screwed it up, okay, well, did you have a good enough process uh, around why they, you know, why that wouldn't wouldn't happen um did you train them well enough did you ask them if today maybe like their kid is sick and they're having a terrible day and they came in late because they had to drop their kid like what is the thing that you could have um okay that that's happened to me so many times like oh my god it's been a year and i didn't even realize that uh she goes to church every morning at 9 a.m and i had my our touch base schedule for then and she never said anything and so she missed that every day and now I ask everybody, you know, hey, what's your what's your personal life like? What are, what are things that I need to know about your, you know, uh, about your life that would impact your, you, you know, your job, uh, so that we can account for them? Um, so there's always there's always something. Josh, we're going to head into rapid fire questions to kind of wrap up. But is there anything that we didn't get a chance to to cover? Because I want to make sure that we get you uh, out of here on time. No, no, I think we, yeah, I think we have a good, cool, cool. good scope. Here. Cool, cool. So I, I frame this as, you know, it's the first day of, of your weekend, whether that's, you know, s Saturday or, or when you're working in restaurants, it was probably Monday or Sunday and you go into the kitchen to kind of make some eggs for yourself. How do you make those eggs? Um, so I, I love scrambled eggs. So I always do scrambled eggs and, and I'll, I'll be honest, American cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and you just put the, put the whole slice on and 
scramble it in? Uh, no, I break it up in a couple. Got it, of got it, got it. And then I like I pull it off the heat and like you know, um, my wife's very particular about like how how the American cheese is melted and making sure it's not too melted. So you know, right at the end. Does your wife cook? She is a very good cook. She's not a uh, you know a chef by trade. She actually is a, an event designer um, and like a floral designer. But she's a very good cook. Very cool. What's one thing you've changed your mind on in recent memory? Um, you know, I think that I, for the longest time, thought that business was um, about great, uh, great product, um, and that's what was the most important thing as a chef. Is I was like, just got to be good food, uh, and it is very important. But I've, I, I think I've come to terms with um, great business, and the best businesses are. Uh, about great people, like do you have like incredible people um, that are be- that are be- that are like behind you and have the same vision as you, uh, and that is only something that has recently sort of really truly sort of crystallized for me. I know that you you have this background as a chef, and you're obviously like busy running day to day with me's now. But is there something that you know if you had to get up and give a TED talk on something that someone who you know kind of only knows you as an acquaintance would be like, wow, I didn't know Josh knew so much about that thing. Is there something that comes to mind? Um, well, it kind of does relate to what I was telling you about, uh, about management. Got like, it. I'm a, uh, I, I really do believe, um, you know, in, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm a, a, I would call myself a, a bit of a stoic and I, and I, my, my entire life is, is sort of revolves around thinking about how I'm complicit in all these things. And it has just, um, really changed my level of happiness, um, and my ability to sort of, you know, accept situations. I would probably give a talk on on that on on um you know uh, on uh, maybe not specifically on stoicism but like how you can um you know like find complicitness in what you do and how that can actually you know, create happiness for yourself. And would you frame that in the in the um so I this is so funny. You would probably frame it in the context of like how managers and and probably founders can can embrace it but I teach a I teach a course for chefs and there's a whole section of a module where I talk about stoicism because I think that it's so important as like a line cook to be able to like there's finger pointing that happens all the time when you're on the line and you know your sous chef forgot to order your grapefruit or whatever and it's like yeah kind of but like when you came in did you triple check that like your produce order got put in or something like that like there, there's so much to like how you respond and then like how it relates to how you kind of um move move throughout the the kitchen and, and through your career um so you know big plus one to stoicism there Great. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I, you should actually, what we should actually do is when we do the next cohort, I, I, I should get you to come and do like a 30 minute kind of like talk to the students about that. Cause I think that would be really impactful. Sure. Cool, cool, cool. Be cool. I'm glad to. Um, obviously you've been cooking for a long time and I only ask this to kind of people who are kind of like have a, have a culinary background. Is there a technique that you're still intimidated by in the kitchen? Um, Let's see. Is there a technique that I'm intimidated by? A dish or a process? Maybe. Um, well, I would say um, that this is, I think it's probably too niche, honestly. Um, like, I haven't really perfected the, the technique of peaking duck well enough. Got it. Um, and, but that might be a little too no, niche. No, it's not. You know? It's not, it's not at all. I mean, there's, there's whole restaurant concepts built around that dish. So it's not niche. It's not and and, and yeah. it's it's proliferated yeah. outside of it. You know, there's a ton of restaurants in California who is like their duck presentation is baking duck, you know, in some way, shape or form. Yeah. 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 You get a call right after this interview that you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, someone you've always wanted to have dinner with is waiting to eat with you. What is that restaurant and who is that person? Wow. That's a, I mean, there's so many people I will, um, Okay, I'm gonna. I'm going to say a restaurant that I wish was still around called Uncle Boone's, um, because I just fucking miss it so much. And I think I would love to have dinner with Mike Maples Jr. Got it. Um, he's uh, he's the founder of this of this firm called Floodgate, and I just think he's such a brilliant like thinker and the way he thinks about business and um, and I love his podcast, Starting Greatness, and uh, it would be fun to sit down with him. What would you ask him? Um, well, I would, uh, so many things, but, uh, you know, I would, I would ask him what, like, you know, what are some of the common things that, um, the common misconceptions he had in, in investments that actually still went right. 
um, you know, because he invested in um, Twitch before it was Twitch, and he invested in Twitter before it was anything, and and um, he he he's you know caught some early. Um, you know, some early investments and he was always, you know, he has a premise about, um, you know, anytime you, you, um, it, this is, this relates more to sort of raising capital, but whenever you hear from an investor, mm, the market isn't big enough for that. Um, well, um, if you, if you said that about Uber, um, you would be in, you would lose a lot of money, uh, because there was no market for it and, and the best startups and the best businesses create their own market. Uh, and that can be said for a lot of restaurants as well, right? Like Noma, there's not a market for uh, a Noma, but, um, you know, they created one. So I think I love finding correlation between business and culinary, uh, because culinary is sort of like what my heart has always been. And there's so many. And um, so whenever I can find those correlations, it helps me to actually absorb, like, the knowledge better. Um, so I would, I, would, I would be asking questions like that. I mean, you mentioned first principle thinking already. And so for, for folks who, you know, kind of uh, aren't familiar with that way of kind of uh, uh, approaching problems or kind of uh, making decisions, I think, uh, you know, what Josh is saying here about kind of like asking these questions from someone who seems to be operating from first principles and why that's so, so valuable. Yeah, I guess Ray Dalio would be a good guy to talk to about that too. <laughs> that too. What a master! Uh, last question for you, Josh. What do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? Um. Well, uh, I think I'm gonna. This is a plug. Use me. <laughs> Document your process, <laughs> uh, your process, and your recipes, uh, so that um, so that you can that you can hand them off. But um, I'd be upset if you, you know, didn't I, say I, that. I, honestly. Yeah. But but I think we also have a responsibility as chefs to um, look. It's it's tough. I'm a you know I'm 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 40 years old, so I I started cooking in a different era um, when it was actually you had to like fight to get a trail at a restaurant and to get a job was just like even harder, uh, especially at the at, at the best ones. And it, and it's very different now. Um, and I think that the the path to becoming a chef is um has changed a bit and i think some for the better and some for the some for the worse and i think that i think we do have a responsibility to try and find ways to try and find common ground to help instill some of that into the ne- new generation of cooks uh that this is not going to be a sprint um and it might seem like it is like it is now because of instagram and all these things but i, I don't think that there's an evergreen you know um solve it because there's over, only so many like Instagram stars and a restaurant like you know this like it's either good or it's not right um, and yes you can start earlier but I think it's you know I, I think we can help the next generation by like instilling the importance of technique and of repetition and of doing the same thing enough times that you actually become a master and that's how you can then iterate um, and I, I don't mean to sound cynical but I, I think some of that may have been lost um, and hopefully we can we can help the next generation kind of like make sure that, that stays in place. I read this great um, piece about the the middle path where it's like you ha- you're, you're walking on one side and then the other side of the path seems super, super attractive and sometimes you'll swing all the way over, but you kind of have to experience that other side in order to walk the middle path. And I think that that could potentially be like what we'll hopefully return to where there's this combination of like, you know, the ability to build brand and to scale and to be profitable that like everybody's kind of like lost in right now, where it's so easy to like start a TikTok account and just like make a gajillion dollars off of cooking on the internet. And then there's this like other side of like true, tried and true, like all the things you just brought up. It's like, could we land in the middle someday? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else, Josh? I really appreciate you coming on the show, and and you know we'll leave links for everybody to check out Mies, uh down below. But is is it, do you have any questions for me or anything anything else that you want to leave the audience with? Uh, no, I would just say uh, thank you for the conversation. It was really great, um, you know, to learn a little bit more about your background and chat with you. It was, it was a pleasure. Awesome. awesome. Uh, okay. Well, uh, until next time, I hope everybody else has a good day, and uh, I hope to meet up with you in New York sometime, Josh, and we can maybe have have dinner. Absolutely. You just let me know. Thanks again. How good was that episode with Josh Sharkey? I would highly encourage any of you folks that want to check out Mies to check out the conversation books a demo to see if that is a software tool that could help you and your business. That's just limited to the first 10 people. So you can check out that link in the description or justincona.com slash Yelp. 
And lastly, DoorDash is offering 0% commissions for new users that encourage uh, their customers to use DoorDash to get deliveries, pick up orders, whatever that would do to help increase your revenue on the month to month to month basis. And so if you want to check that out, there's a link in the description of the podcast or justincona.com slash DoorDash. Well, well, here we are again together at the end of another episode of the Emulsion Podcast. If this was your first time listening, this is a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. It's really, really great to have you. This is a friendly reminder to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests I've had on the show, links to specifics that may have gotten brought up in this episode, and ways to find other helpful content that I create and share online. If you're still here listening, there's a pretty good chance you're going to enjoy what I put out there because it's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week. It's called the 8020 Edge, and there I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, that's where the 8020 comes from, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. I say it's a great time saver because I also include all of the content in that newsletter that I publish every week, everything that I've posted on Instagram, new podcast episodes, and YouTube videos. Speaking of YouTube, you should check out the YouTube channel. There I have gear reviews of knives, spoons, pieces of equipment that I've tested, documented experiences, so going out to eat videos from some of the best restaurants in the world, and other kind of tips and tricks videos of advice that I think would be helpful for you. Lastly, if you want to learn about my intense professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or support the show financially, you can check out justincona.com support to learn more, and that's greatly appreciated. Last up, and I know that other podcast hosts say it too because it really does help, is to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts because that helps the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.